the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt is understood in four main ways theologically. Now the basic conviction is this, that what looks like a great escape story from a human point of view is in fact the work of God. So God is at work behind and in this event in human history. And God's role in delivering the Israelites is understood in terms of four pictures, if you like, or four images, or four, four analogies. First of all, it's an act of redemption. Now, unfortunately, in modern English, we have, uh, there's no exact equivalent to the verbs that are used in connection with that. Um, go'el, from ga'al, in uh, Hebrew, now, this is a term that's commonly found in connection with tribal societies. If you explain this to an Aboriginal, they won't, you won't have to explain it to them, they'll be able to explain it to you. Now, um, who is your kinsman? Your, who is your go-ail? Kinsman redeemer, that's about the way, only way of translating it. Who is my redeemer? Well, my redeemer is the oldest male relative on my father's side. So can you think of it? Who is your redeemer, Tom? Uncle Tim. Uncle Tim, is he older than Dad? By a couple of hours. Okay. No that, of course, yes. Okay. So uh, who is your redeemer, Tom? My dad. Your dad. Do any of you still have a grandfather on your father's side alive? Okay, so when my grandfather was alive, it would have been my grandfather. And then when there were still some uncles left who were my father's brothers, it would have been them. Now I happen to have an older brother, so he is my kinsman redeemer. I have an older brother. Uh, now, what is the role of a kinsman in a tribal society? Well, number one, if anybody within the family goes, gets into debt, then um, the kinsman redeemer, the, let's call him just redeemer, then the redeemer gets the money together to bail that family member out of debt. Um, that's if they are about to be imprisoned and uh, the debt collectors come and threaten to take the land or assets away from them. If a person gets into slavery either from debt or as a prisoner of war, and that was a common thing in the ancient world, um, where people, if you're on the losing side in battle, then the defeated army would be sold on the slave market. So let's say, for example, Todd, you were in a battle, you were, Ben, 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 sorry, Ben, you were in a battle, you were captured, then what would your father do? Or is, you have any other kinsmen? Redeemer? Okay, he's the oldest, what would he do? He'd pay to get you out, he'd buy you free. And he would get all the resources of all the Fifa clan together. Not just the immediate family, but the whole tribe would pull in to uh, uh, free you from uh, slavery. Thirdly, so um, Redeemer redeems from debt, redeems from slavery. Thirdly, redeems in a court of law. Now, court of law uh, were much more informal in the ancient world than our modern uh, courts of law. They were basically in the village square. You had the elders were the judges. You had the person accusing somebody. What was the role of a redeemer in a court of law? Well, he would be the defender, the counsel for defense of a person who was being accused of a crime. So he would be the advocate for somebody in a court of law. Fourthly, if uh, as a result of maybe some uh, taxation or debt I l would look like losing my property, which doesn't belong to me but belongs to God and the whole family, then the Redeemer would get the money together to stop the land from being sold outside the family. So I might lose the land, but the land would stay within the 
family and I would still be able to live off the land. But the land wouldn't belong to me anymore, it belonged to the family as a whole. So we'd redeem the land. Lastly, mo most startlingly, uh, let's say I died without uh, fathering a male heir. Then um, it would be the job of my kinsman redeemer himself, my kinsman, my redeemer, either to have sex with my wife until she had a child or one other male within the family to have sex with her until she has a child. And that child then from my wife wouldn't be his child but would be my child. So you redeem the family. Remember that this happens with Ruth. Ruth is redeemed. The family of Ruth and Naomi is redeemed in both of those things. They get the land back and they get uh, the family back by having a male heir. Now that's the kinsman redeemer. Have you got the basic picture? Well, God redeems his people. Why does he redeem his people? Because they are his um, his kinsfolk. And he therefore pays to free them. Um, so he ransoms them from captivity and slavery. It's these first two senses that you have here. Uh, the Israelites were threatened with uh, extinction through genocide. God intervenes to save their lives and to save his family. And he then restores their livelihood, their land to them. So he brings them into his land so that they can have an assured livelihood. So uh, the deliverance from Egypt is an act of redemption. Do you get the basic picture? The second picture is very closely related to that. The uh, Exodus is an act of emancipation. Uh, emancipation means freeing somebody from slavery. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Um, now, I'd like to introduce uh, some terminology to you. That's very, very important. Um, Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go so that they may serve me. Now, he uses the P-A-L of shalach. Now, shalach is to stretch out your hand and then to send somebody. In the P-A-L, it means to send out somebody but also to release somebody, to set somebody free. So, let my people go means release my people from slavery. That's how pictures used, release from slavery. Uh, then the second set of terminology, which is very important, um, and uh, uh, is not always clearly evident in the translations, is the playing around the verb yatsar. Um, and this is the, where the word exodus, in fact, comes from. Exodus means going out. Coming from here, yatsar, which means to go out. So the Israelites go out from Egypt. They march out of Egypt, but they go free. So the verb yatsar, to go out, means to go free. In the hefil, it means to bring out, but then also to set free from somebody, to bring free, to liberate. One of the commonest phrases that you'll find in the Old Testament is God being referred to, he says, I am Yahweh, Ani Yahweh, ha ho -tzi the one who brings out, or who brought out, the Israelites from Egypt. The one who br brought out means the one who liberated, who freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So God is the one who brought his people out from slavery in Egypt. Uh, God comes and demands of Pharaoh the release of his people, and he says, if Pharaoh doesn't let them go, he will uh, uh, use a, the, his right hand and his outstretched arm, which means that he will use military force.
to free his people. They go out from Egypt means that they go free. So the act of the, ex the exodus is an act of emancipation, an act of liberation. Now these first two are very closely related. The second picture is not so evident, but is, uh, uh, you can see it everywhere. The deliverance from Egypt is seen as a victory. A victory, not a political victory between Moses as a political leader and Pharaoh as a political leader, but a, a victory of God over gods and the powers of chaos. So God is the divine warrior. He single-handedly takes on Pharaoh and his armies. Um, Pharaoh is the incarnation of the sun god. It's his duty to maintain ma'at, cosmic order. That's according to Egyptian theology. Um, you may remember, and I've explained this to you elsewhere, that uh, every day Pharaoh, oh no, the sun god goes, in, according to G Egyptian theology, ascends into the underworld to take on Seth the god of chaos and darkness, to put Seth back in his place, and he rises victorious over Seth in the morning and gives the fruit of his victory as the sun god to the people of Egypt for the day. Every day he does battle with Seth. Every day he puts Seth back into his box, defeats Seth. But there is never any knockout blow. Every day, every day this has to be repeated. And occasionally you get an eclipse of the sun, which means what? Yes. Seth has won the victory. Uh, the sun god is failed, and Pharaoh, who is supposed to help the sun god descend into the underworld and to keep him safe and to bring him out safely by the performance of magic, hasn't done his job properly, and so the sun god is still locked away. And Seth has won the victory. Um, now, um, so when Pharaoh enslaves the Egyptian, and when Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites, it's a form not just of political oppression, but it's spiritual oppression. To put it in Christian terms, Pharaoh represents or fronts for Satan and the powers of darkness. And Moses then is called not only to deliver the Israelites politically from Egypt, but to deliver them from the Egyptian gods. Uh, God is the divine champion. And you'll see then initially Moses uh, interacts not only with Pharaoh, but also the magicians. Uh, the Egyptian magicians or sorcerers. Pharaoh exercises spiritual power, but the power he exercises is occult power, sorcery magic. If any of you study Egyptian theology, you'll see that it's riddled with magic, sorcery from beginning to end. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Moses engages with the sorcerers and he overcomes them. But it's not Moses, it's the Lord through Moses who is the champion. Now you remember from Bible introduction, so I won't go to great length of it, the ten plagues are ten battles in the war between God and the Egyptian God. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, Elizabeth, and read that, please. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will smite all firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. Right I am the Lord. God will execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. The first three plagues deal with the gods of the underworld, and he dispossesses them. The next three, the gods of the earth. And the last three have to do with the rule of the sun god in the sky. And the number ten is Pharaoh's son, so the incarnation of the sun god. Um, 
God is the divine champion. So you get on the one hand, in this boxing ring, in this battle, you have God who fights alone against all the Egyptian gods. And there are thousands of Egyptian gods. And God single-handedly wins the battle. Now, this is emphasized um, in a number of different ways. Um, the Israelites are the 12 armies of Israel. They are the 12 divisions of the Lord. Savar is army. The name, the title that's given to the Lord is Yahweh Sevaoth, which means the God, Lord Yahweh of the armies. So which are God's armies? He has earthly armies, the 12 tribes of Israel. He has heavenly armies, which are the angels. So his earthly armies, heavenly armies. The Israelites are the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 armies of God. But they perform a very funny role in the great battle between God and the gods of Egypt. Their task is not to do a thing, they merely are to stand still and witness the victory of God. So all they are to do is to call on the name of the Lord, he does the fighting, they watch the battle, and they then witness the victory of the Lord over Pharaoh and his armies and the gods of Egypt. Um, and after the battle, then they plunder the enemy. Let's have a look at that theme of um, uh, the witnessing of the victory, which is very important for New Testament theology. Tom, can you read chapter 14, 13 to 14, and then 30 to 31? And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Not silent. It still is, you, you need only hold your hands to your side. You relax your hands. You don't have to lift a hand. You can drop your hands. So uh, you will see the Lord's deliverance, the Lord's victory. The Lord does the fighting. The Israelites witness, bear witness to the victory. Go to the end of the chapter. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Uh, now, for the last point, you need to understand Egyptian theology. Every day... The sun god would descend from his throne in heaven and would, at the end of the day, enter the underworld and there defeat Seth and all the gods of the underworld. Every morning he would rise victorious from the underworld. Now, according to ancient thinking, if uh, you entered the underworld, the most obvious way into the underworld is through the sea. So both the river in Egypt and the sea are the domain of Seth, the god of the underworld. Now how does God save the Israelites? There's ten battles, the ten plagues, and then there's the final battle. What does God do? He himself enters what domain? Death. He enters the domain of death, of underworld, of chaos. He goes before them, and according to the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15, he turns the abyss into a solid pavement. So the abyss congeals and becomes a bitumen road. So he makes a bitumen highway in the abyss. He himself goes in front of the people into the underworld, if you like, into the domain of Seth. And then once the Israelites are there, then he goes from the front of the Egyptian, I mean the Israelite army, and he goes to the back. 
and something strange happens there. So if you can envisage, the way this story is told is that you have dry land, you've got sea here. Dry land floats on the sea. The sea goes down into an abyss. There's no bottom to that. What God does is paves a way through the sea. And he does it by going out in front of the Israelites. Now once the whole Israelite uh, community is in the sea, he goes from the front to the back. And so you have the Egyptians here and the Israelites here. That's the picture. And the glory cloud is, brings light to the Israelites and it brings darkness to the Egyptians. Once all the Israelites have passed through the sea, then what happens? The waters close and they go down here. Now what's the theology that lies behind that, uh, if you like, mythological way of thinking? The, uh, God, oh, sorry, the Egyptians get, the Egyptians get oh, overwhelmed into the underworld and who's at the head of the Egyptians? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. So Pharaoh, his son was killed in the last plague. What happens to Pharaoh? He dies, he dies and he goes where he belongs. And where does he belong? Not up here with the sun god, but down here. And the sun god can't save him. The sun god's power is defeated. He cannot save his son, who then is lost forever in the underworld. That's the one side of it, the story. What's the other side of the story? God uh, went through into death. Yes. And, and then achieved a victory over death and the underworld. Uh, That's right. And with all the people as well. With all the people. So God with the people... Um, brings them through death, out of death, through chaos into order, out of the darkness into the light, all that kind of thinking. But it's not also like in defeat the other world right then and there in that sense of where they were thinking of in that, in that way so to sidestep their way of thinking and just brought them to where they needed to go. Yes. And sort of humiliated That's right. by, you know, giving him the punishment he deserved, which is his yes. mind thinking was the underworld, even yes. though it's not actually. Yep. Yeah. So right. I don't buy into this thinking. Sorry, what? What I'm saying is like God didn't buy into the thinking. No. He used it against them. He uses it against them because, uh, in fact, then, this is uh, a foretaste of something else. The prophecy. Because remember the Apostles' Creed? Jesus didn't just die, but he descended into hell, the underworld. And the third day he rose again, victorious. So uh, uh, Christian thinking is that uh, Jesus' death and resurrection is the great exodus from Egypt, is the great deliverance, is the great victory. So the victory of God over Pharaoh and his armies in a little way, Nathan, is a pointer to the great victory which is achieved by Christ's death and resurrection. Um, now, uh, this theme of uh, the victory of Jesus by his descent into the underworld is very strong in the Church Fathers, as you probably know. Have you all done Christology yet? Redemption. Redemption, Redemption is Christology. Uh, you, know, you have various models of the atonement. Funny way of looking at it. Uh, there's the Christus Victor, Christ the Victor. Okay, that it attaches itself, it picks up these themes and develops them in New Testament and in the early church. This is Luther's favourite picture, in fact. Um, not the, uh, I would have expected his favourite picture to be this or this, but this is his favourite picture for what Christ achieves and what Christ accomplishes. It's very, very common 
in the uh, patristic period. Um, but now, your thinking here is in order, chaos, light, darkness, uh, the defeat then of Pharaoh, which prefigures the defeat of Satan and all the powers of darkness. Uh, just to end that, you can see how uh, Paul picks it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I don't know who's next. Is it Murray or is it ben. Ben, Benjamin? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is what uh, Paul has in mind when he says in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I know that's what he's referring to there, this great uh, victory. And then he talks about the desert. Despite their great deliverance, um, most of them died in the desert uh, because they uh, rebelled against God. Um, I would, I would encourage you to look closely at this particular theme because uh, I have a hunch that that will speak more powerfully to people of the coming generation than these two pictures. Future, the idea of uh, victory over evil powers of dark powers, the defeat of Satan, uh, the great victory of God, and the role of uh, Christians and spiritual warfare is not to do any fighting but merely to call on the champion Christ to do the fighting and to witness the victory so we are to use Paul's term in spiritual warfare we are not uh, offensive warriors but we are on sentry duty uh, witnessing the victory of God over the powers of evil now, next period, I want to look at the Exodus as an act of theophany and then also the purpose of the Exodus, which has to do with divine service, the liturgical purpose of the Exodus, before we begin work on the Sinai Covenant.